Part Two The Humanoid Examined In facing toward the threat of authoritarianism, our primary concern is not with its expression as a political system or as a set of beliefs. These are secondary matters. Our primary concern is with the substance of authoritarian politics and beliefs, the type of being which the authoritarian is, namely a humanoid. It is at this basic level that we come to understand not only the full nature of authoritarianism, but far more importantly, we come to see some of the practical ways in which this plague of mankind can be controlled so that we can have a holistic view of the several facets of the authoritarian character structure, it is best that we describe it in the following areas. 1. The authoritarian syndrome. 2. The consciousness of the humanoid. 3. The body of the humanoid. And 4. The behavior of the humanoid. The Authoritarian Syndrome A humanoid is a being who is incapable of mobilizing his own intentions. This, in essence, is his psychopathology. He cannot will for himself. He cannot will for himself because he has never learned to do so. The incapacity to will for oneself is not a genetic trait. It is not in the least an inherited inability. Rather, it is an achieved inability. Specifically, this inability means that the earlier rearing and education of a human being either discouraged or never gave the chance for this active willing to take place. It means that during a person's formative years, he became habituated to having someone else frame his projects, directions, and purposes. Somebody did his willing for him, and did it so effectively and convincingly that he never learned to do it for himself. Who could this be that prevented the authoritarian from learning to will for himself? The answer to this does not require belabored research. Everyone knows the answer, since it is a matter of common observation and common sense. It is the parents who prevent the humanoid from learning to will for himself. The parents are primary. The secular and religious educational institutions to which the child is later exposed are also powerful influences, and these serve, by and large, as reinforcing agents to the primary intentions of the parents. It is the obligation of parents to care for and give guidance to the infant human in his dependency and helplessness, and it is equally the obligation of parents to intend to give up this primary task of caring for and guiding the maturing human being, lest that human remain in this dependency and helplessness. But some parents do not know when to stay the hand of guidance. Some parents have never learned when to let the human fledgling go, to flap his own wings, to grow and transcend his insufficiencies. Their concern is to control the child and to see him obedient to their guidance. Indeed, some parents are so concerned to control the young human and instill obedience, respect, and self-consciousness in him that this young human being becomes habitually obedient, respectful, and self-conscious. That is, the parents succeed. Specifically, they succeed in preventing that young human from growing up. They succeed in producing a human being who, despite his one and twenty years, is not a mature human being, self-directing and self-sufficient. He has not been weaned. And in this simple and widespread procedure we recognize the basic intention of authoritarian education. It is to prevent the full maturation of the human being. It is to prevent the human being from becoming free and autonomous. All authoritarian education, whether it be in the home, in the schools, in the universities, or in religious, military, and political institutions, is founded on this simple policy, to inhibit growth and maturation 
so as to keep the human dependent and obedient to an authority external to himself. Parents, schools, universities, churches, and associations do not say that this is what they are doing. They simply do it. And the result of this doing is the creation of a humanoid, a member of the human species who has been intentionally denied his God-given birthright to his full human capacities. The tradition of authoritarianism is to hold the human being beneath the level of full maturation into humanity. This is a tradition which does not in the least believe in the free man. It believes only in the humanoid and it believes in perpetuating itself. Tyranny begins then in the home and the immediate environment. Where else could it begin? And the first tyrants are well-meaning, tyrannical parents. Who else could it be? By definition, parents become tyrants when they prevent their children from growing up. And normally, tyrannical parents have done their job by the time the child reaches puberty. If they can hold down the expansive, adventurous, freedom and autonomy-seeking drives for the first 12 years or so, then they will likely have produced a humanoid. That first known society of the family world has provided practical, interpersonal training in how to deal with the powers and authoritative persons in human society. Be watchfully subservient and bridled. And this person will remain a tyrant-needing, tyrant-seeking humanoid for the remainder of his life unless some external trauma occurs in his life, either accidentally or through psychotherapeutic intervention. Whether gradually or abruptly, the awakening of a humanoid to his full powers and freedom as a human being is the most significant of all human conversions. Taking possession of oneself and claiming sole responsibility for oneself is the way of getting free and staying free. At the heart of the humanoid's pathology is the fact that he is not his own master. It is not he in his wholeness who meets and responds to the people and situations of his world. He always uses less than his whole self to respond to his environment, i.e., he does not and cannot act fully on his own, but habitually lets other rules and other persons mobilize his intentions. He is, then, always disposed to look outside himself in order to intend a full action. He has, during his formative years, been so tyrannized that he is no longer able nor believes it possible to originate a holistic intention. What I am describing is the syndrome of the authoritarian, the traits by which we recognize the humanoid in others and especially in ourselves. Thus, two of the traits to emerge are that the humanoid is obedient and that he is outward-looking, i.e., he is habitually attentive to other persons and other authorities outside himself in order to be able to act. This is quite understandable inasmuch as habitual parental and institutional control over the young human is intended to render him obedient and outwardly attentive. A third strand in this syndrome is that the humanoid is fearful. He has, moreover, every reason to be afraid. He is not in control of himself, and not to be in control of oneself is to be in continuing danger and insecurity. It is an inhumane horror to rear human beings who are so primally uncertain of themselves, so habitually dependent and outward-looking and obedient that at any given instant they are aware of not being wholly in control of themselves. That is why they must vigilantly be outward-looking to their authority and must be obedient to rules. Without that supporting and sustaining authority, they are without recourse and are exposed to the myriad dangers of a threatening world. To say that the humanoid is fearful is simultaneously to say that he sees the world as an arena of danger. The sequence is the following. Because he cannot will for himself, he is dependent. Because he is dependent, he is insecure in himself. Because he is always insecure in himself, he is always fearful. 
And because he is always fearful, he always sees danger lurking outside. This trait of fearfulness underlines a matter which has already been brought to evidence in our discussion of the plectognathic generation, that the authoritarian is paranoid. The authoritarian always sees danger lurking out in the world. He is always under siege, always in combat. This habitual fearfulness is evidenced in the humanoid's constant bent toward suspicion, distrust, and caution, and his belief that conspiracy and ill intent may lie behind all that is unusual, spontaneous, or in general, unauthorized. This fear is equally evidenced in his negativism, pessimism, and bent toward naysaying. The authoritarian's motto is, anything new is suspect. And so he greets the unusual with alarm, seeing conspiracies, plots, and secret dangers behind the unaccustomed and unannounced. This is the panicky and threatened consciousness typical of all reactionaries and Philistines. Novelty and change are, by definition, dangerous and wrong. By their paranoia shall ye know them, for the authoritarian is gifted with eyes that see danger where other eyes do not. It is this constant, never-ceasing spur of fear and paranoid delusion that has been the constant theme of the plectognathic generation from the McCarthy era of the 50s to the Nixon era of the early 1970s. Moreover, this inward spur of fear is not unlinked with the fourth strand of the authoritarian syndrome, namely that the authoritarian is always suffering. It is for him a way of life. For him it is, indeed, life itself. Another motto of the authoritarian is, life is suffering. Life is suffering because the humanoid suffers. He suffers constantly. He is constantly ill at ease. Albert Camus, in his novel, The Fall, speaks of an ingeniously designed prison cell which is built to be just small enough so that the unfortunate prisoner could never during his long confinement stretch his body out to its full length. This cell was called the malconfort, the ill at ease, wherein a human always lived cramped and limited, never being able to expand out to his full dimensions. The ill at ease, that is the cell in which the humanoid has, by his past training, been condemned to live his life, never to stretch the limit, never to feel the ease and joy and fulfillment of being fully oneself. Camus saw that all the modern urban humanoids of our society live in those confining, limiting cells for life, and that these miserable middle-class humanoids expected this confinement and accepted it because that was their understanding of what life was. Always to be suffering a bit, never to be at ease and whole. Even as fear always reflects an absence of security, so does suffering always reflect an absence of pleasure and satisfaction. It is pleasure and satisfaction which the humanoid lacks. He cannot have them, and he does not expect to have them because life, by his habitual definition, is suffering. It has been caught in the ill at ease. We see the full scope of the humanoid's misery when we realize that for him, suffering is the sustaining and positive act of living. Pleasure is a negative. It is merely an escape, a momentary surcease, a negation of the positive fact of eternal discomfort. He feels that he does not have a right to pleasure, nor does anyone else. The right to pursue one's own personal happiness seems to him ultimately wrong and contrary to the nature of human life. There is no logical reason why suffering should be basic and positive, pleasure being its contingent negation. The reason is experiential. That is the way the humanoid experiences his life. 
he has been placed into the ill at ease by others and is kept in it by his own habituation and he is so totally unaware of his unnecessary misfortune that he will predictably defend the rights of his jailers to keep him in disease that again is pathological these are four of the strands constituting the authoritarian syndrome the authoritarian is obedient outward-looking fearful and diseased there is a fifth strand of this syndrome a strand which completes the knotted rope that binds the humanoid into his immaturity this is the strand which also binds him into the texture of an authoritarian society the humanoid is always a member of a team the humanoid does not act alone he cannot he must always act in concert with the team he must belong to a team and find his identity and raison d'etre with the total flow of that organized group without the feeling of belonging to an organized active system the humanoid is lost he needs inclusion in a team a place in the team a direction by the team and a justification from the team the humanoid has been trained to be obedient to the team to constantly look outward to the team to be fearful of what is not sanctioned by the team and to be sacrificially diseased in his loyal service to the team this fifth strand is an always reliable index to the pathology of the authoritarian personality for at the sickened heart of the humanoid is the eternal awareness that he alone cannot will for himself to be unable to originate an action and frame the intention for an action is simultaneously a basic index of human immaturity a basic index of dependency and a basic impulsion to be member of a team which will originate and frame the humanoids actions this is what the team provides it creates a meaning and intention for all the injured and lost souls who cannot from within their own lives create their own meanings and intentions the meaning and direction of action of the team is the external framework for what is internally missing in the dependent humanoid the team does for the humanoid what he cannot do for himself it is upon this rock that authoritarian builds its church and it is upon this human pathology that all totalitarian groups feed and grow whether the totalitarian team is an army a religious hierarchy a corporate bureaucracy a marauding gang or a hunting pack it is all the same the fodder thrown into the authoritarian machine is the millions of eager and dependent humanoids who volunteer themselves totalitarian is totally dependent upon humanoids humanoids are totally dependent upon totalitarian gangs and it is in the marriage of these dependencies that all authoritarian societies throughout history have found their origin and continuation not only do humanoids need and demand authoritarian social orders but these orders need and demand humanoids because humanoids are the fodder of totalitarianism tyrannical social regimes always attend to the supply of humanoids all aspects of public education and public information are controlled by authoritarians so as to guarantee a continuing supply of humanoid fodder there is no basic distinction between the authoritarian philosophy of education and the techniques of raising livestock both procedures breed and train living beings for a purpose and that purpose is defined by the needs of the group that does the breeding and training in summary authoritarian teams from top to bottom are composed of humanoids both leaders and team members and all humanoids make up the composition of authoritarian teams it is a device of continuing mutual dependency where humanoids look outside themselves for a team of other humanoids who have formed a group plan of action all authoritarians are humanoids and vice versa there is no distinction 
One is the group and the other is the total constituency of the group. There is no distinction between leaders and led. In authoritarian societies, humanoids lead other humanoids into humanoidism, somewhat as in herds cows lead other cows into cowism. It is a circle which goes nowhere and intends to go nowhere. It is a self-perpetuating pathology where we cannot separate the individual psychopathology from the social psychopathology. Obedience, outward-looking, fearfulness, disease, and team membership. These are the five strands of the authoritarian syndrome. They are also the five strands of a totalitarian society.